I'm so indebted to uh, my older sister in Christ, Mary, uh, my big sister. She's such a comfort to me when I feel like I'm spit up and chewed out by the biblical establishment. I go to her for comfort. <laughs> I feel like she got my back. Um, and she laid down uh, the foundation uh, for our looking at the Jubilee. And we're going to go over some of the same territory, but looking at different aspects of it, as well as look at, look at some further texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls and elsewhere that really help us to get further into the meaning of this great year of freedom. So Dr. Healy uh, looked at this key text from Leviticus 25, you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so 49 years. Now notice all the sevens, right? And uh, as, as Dr. Hahn has pointed out many times, you know, we say that seven is the number of completion or it's a sacred number. That's rather bland. It's true, but it just kind of lies there. It's really something more specific than that. Seven is the number of covenant, right? So in the Hebrew language, uh, one of the words for oath is a form of the word seven, shava, okay? And uh, why is that? And, and to swear an oath in Hebrew is nishva. It's a, what, they, what scholars call the nifal form, or it's a middle passive. It means to do something to yourself seven times. Well, why would, you know, sevening yourself be the number or be the uh, verb for covenant making in Hebrew? Well, it comes from the practice of performing an action seven times in order to solemnize it. And so in, in ancient uh, Israelite society, you would speak a sacred promise seven times or perform an action seven times. And that made it not just a promise, but an oath. And we see that in Genesis 21, where Abraham and uh, the local king Abimelech, they, ex they exchange seven ewe lambs in order to swear an oath to one another and form a covenant. And what is covenant? Well, we all know this as well. Covenant is a family formed by oath swearing. All right, so you want to become family member of someone who's not related to you by blood, you swear an oath to them and you form a family. Now, the Jubilee was the culmination of Israel's liturgical calendar. Okay, we find it in Leviticus 25. The liturgical calendar explanation of Leviticus begins back in chapter 23, and it begins with the uh, festival, which is the shortest duration, which is the weekly Sabbath, and then it builds up uh, to uh, festivals that you celebrate on an annual basis and then ultimately a super annual basis. In other words, uh, festivals that you celebrate on cycles of multiple years. And the, the one great festival that had the longest period of duration was the Jubilee. So it was like the culmination of the whole liturgical calendar of Israel. All comes to head at the greatest feast. And this is the, the year of Jubilee. So, of course, this is all based on God's covenant with the people of Israel. And so we see these multiples of sevens, seven times, seven years, 490 years. It's like Sabbath squared, okay, covenant squared. And then you celebrate Jubilee. So all these ideas of family and of uh, restoration and forgiveness that Dr. Healy was ta telling us about teaching us about, <coughs> all, comes to, all comes to fruition at this time. You shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim, thank you, proclaim liberty throughout the land. <coughs> it shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you shall return. Um, by the way, this line from Leviticus 25.10, this is on the Liberty Bell down in Philly, actually. You shall proclaim liberty throughout the land. So our country, you know, our, our, whole, our whole ethos has been shaped by these biblical concepts. You ever notice how our capital, by the way, you know, Washington, D.C., it's surrounded on three sides by Maryland, right? 
And then underneath it is virgin ya, you know? You think the Blessed Mother doesn't have some special purpose for the U.S.? I think she does, amen? <coughs> and these deep biblical concepts are really present kind of despite, despite some of the uh, tendencies of our founding fathers. So the, the Jubilee was all about covenant. It was covenant fruition. Where's the other book of the Bible where we, we find seven upon seven upon seven? Where's that? Hmm? Book of Revelation, right? All those sevens of sevens of sevens. What's that all about in the book of Revelation? Well, it's all covenant fulfillment. That's all the repetitions of sevens there are teaching us covenant culmination because that's where everything wraps up. And likewise, the Jubilee was the culmination of the liturgical calendar. So seven upon seven, everything is coming together. And as Dr. Healy so uh, well pointed out, this released everyone from debt, released everyone from servitude, so everybody could go home to their ancestral property and be reunited to their family and be restored to freedom. And, uh, and so what, were they gonna, what are they going to do, you know, when all these alienated cousins and sons and so on come, you know, wandering back from where they've been exiled or enslaved, et cetera, and get back to the family property? What are you going to do? Well, have a cookout, of course. So I just see that, the, you know, the, the Day of Atonement, because this was on the Day of Atonement, and that's very important. Because you see how this happens? First, forgiveness of sin is affected. First, that, that, um, uh, that relationship with God is restored through the forgiveness of sin. And then relationships between human beings <coughs> are likewise restored. That was the principle of the Jubilee. <coughs> Excuse me. It's proclaimed on the Day of Atonement. But notice what comes first. First comes reconciliation with God, then comes reconciliation with other human beings. We get this concept? So the year of Jubilee was... This, as Dr. Healy pointed out, a socioeconomic expression of a spiritual reality. You know what our problem in America is? We get the cart before the horse. We're trying to reconcile all of, uh, you know, people of diverse backgrounds, etc., without being concerned at all with reconciliation with God. Okay? But divine revelation gets it right. And divine revelation insists that one first needs to experience forgiveness of God, then one can share that forgiveness that one has experienced with your fellow human beings. The vertical takes precedent, okay? And as long as we're, see we're seeking for purely political, purely materialistic solutions to our problems, you know, trying to do what the UN does, which is reconcile people without worrying about reconciliation with God, it's never going to work. Okay. Has it been working? No. Okay. So what should we do? Well, try the same thing again and hope for different results, right? That's smart. That always works, so we keep doing this. But no, meanwhile, the scriptures are crying out to us, you got to be reconciled with God first. First reconciliation with God. Then the peace which is established in the human heart can spread into society. We try to establish peace in society without worrying about the human heart. And it doesn't work. It's not going to work. Okay, so understand that. So the, the, it's, the, the theological is primary. So they have these cookouts, you know. So I, I, see, I see the, you know, the day of atonement, the year of Jubilee, and you're looking out over the Israelite countryside, you have rolling hills and what they call the Shephelah, you know, and you got the, the mountain range there, and you got the seacoast down there, and you're looking out, and all of a sudden you see smoke rising from all over. Well, is it, and what is that? That's the charcoal grills, you know? They're having, they're having lamb chops, you know, and, uh, and uh, beef bratwurst, right? Not pork bratwurst, you know, beef, beef bratwurst, you know, it's, they're grilling, you know, 
Charcoal, no gas grills. Gas grills are toe va. That's an abomination, right? Okay. It was. I learned to grill in downtown Grand Rapids, down in the hood. We did not use gas grills. We had. I, I can't even say what we we call people that use gas grills. I mean, what's what's the point of that? You just cook inside if you want to cook on gas. Just go in your kitchen. You got a gas stove in your kitchen. You can go inside. What's that? You know, that takes no skill. It's like hunting with an automatic weapon. I mean, like, what's the point? You know, charcoal. So the ancient Israelites are very pure. It's charcoal, you know. So, you know, throw those burgers on there. Throw those lamb chops on there. Let's celebrate, okay, because it's the Day of Atonement. So it had all that wonderful smell of uh, grilling meat all over in its family, its family restoration. And that's what Dr. Hahn so, uh, so uh, accurately pointed out, you know, and, and I'm right with him. This is something I addressed in my dissertation. <coughs> this abuse of the Jubilee to argue for some kind of communist or socialist utopia. The problem with that is communism and socialism always, org always ignores the family. When the Jubilee was fundamentally family-oriented, and I've, I've been, you know, Father Louis Morozny is going to be speaking at this conference. I've talked with him about this, even asked him to write something about this. But uh, we got to start talking about the socioeconomic impact of the family. That say, for, for example, marriage and family policy is a matter of social justice, okay? We've conceded the whole social justice argument to people that want to have big government solutions and throw a lot of money at the problem. You know, we've been throwing money at the problem since Lyndon Baines Johnson, okay? Has it worked? Do we have a great society? No, we don't. We have, <laughs> we have a miserable society is what we got. And we keep throwing more money, and we keep printing more money and throwing more money. And, and what do we not talk about? We don't talk about chastity. You know, chastity is a social justice issue, not fathering children that you're not going to take care of, okay? Entering into the bond, covenant bonds before you begin to raise a family, okay? Marriage is a social justice issue. Biggest predictor of poverty in America, fatherlessness. Okay? We don't talk about that. That's not politically correct. Okay? But we can't concede that issue. Okay? We've got to bring the family back into front and center. Okay? The, the family is a, socio, is, is, is a social justice issue. And even apart from material wealth, it's psychological. Okay? When we have all these broken families, when you grow up not being assured that you are the product of love between your father and mother, that the two persons that brought you into the world loved each other, and you were the fruit of their love. See, that leads to psychological health, amen? And that's what the scourge of divorce and all broken homes and casual sexuality, what that does is it, it raises up a generation where, you know, am I loved? Am I the fruit of love? Why am I here? You know, am I the product of a drunken bout? You know, all this kind of thing. And, uh, and even if you do well, you know, even if you make money and, you know, are, are successful by external uh, measures, you have that disorder inside, you have that lack of health, that lack of wholeness, because you're not assured of that. We don't even talk about that. But the Jubilee was all about family. The Jubilee was all about making sure that the family stayed intact, that we didn't have broken families due to the father being enslaved, and we didn't have fatherlessness due to a man being alienated from his family and having to work for somebody else uh, for, for slave wages and uh, all of that. So it ensured, it ensured land, so the family had a place for itself, a place where they could bury their ancestors and could remember their grandparents, etc., remember their family history. The Jubilee was all oriented to that, and that's what, that's what so many scholars don't want to talk about when they, when they discuss the Jubilee. They want to talk about some kind of socialist redistribution. They don't want to talk about family and land and tradition, these things that really lead to psychological and spiritual health. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, let's move on and talk about this. As Dr. Healy pointed out, 
the Israelites at best were inconsistent about observing the Jubilee. And it became an issue in their relationship with God. It was a manifestation of their larger pattern of covenant breaking. And so in 2 Chronicles 36, 20, near the end of the history of Israel as a uh, monarchy, we read about King Bab uh, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, who took into exile in Babylon those who escaped from the sword until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbath. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So God waited, and over a period of roughly 500 years, they did not keep the Sabbath year, they did not keep the Jubilee, and as it were, these things are adding up. And at that end of that period, God sent as judgment upon them the Babylonian army, which took them exile, and they left the land, and then finally the land had its rest, okay? There's also an ecological dimension to the Sabbath year and the Jubilee, allowing nature to rest. And the Israelites had robbed nature of its opportunity to rest. They had violated the natural order. And so that natural order needs to, needed to be restored. So they were removed from the land so the land could recoup its rest. And roughly the time that they were in Babylonian exile, 70 years, corresponded to the Sabbath years that they failed to keep, okay? So this is something to think about. You know, when we fail to rest to honor God, God sometimes has to send us something that makes us rest, okay? It's like illness or unemployment or inability to work or whatever. You know, there's a kind of a natural rhythm to this. When we violate the created order, by refusing to take God's opportunities and his commands to rest, it comes back to us. It, it boomerangs on us. And this was the case with the people of Israel. And so that period of exile between roughly uh, you know, 597 and around 527 BC, when they were experiencing exile at the hands of the Babylonians, was this time of rest of the land. And um, this violation of the Sabbath year and the Jubilee caused the prophets to enter more deeply into prayer, and the Holy Spirit began to reveal to them that the, the hopes and the expectations that were embedded in the Jubilee were going to be fulfilled in the latter days, fulfilled in a time of completion which would be associated with the coming of the servant of the Lord, who we later come to recognize as the Messiah. And so we read in Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is a God is upon me. This is the servant of the Lord speaking in the first person because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And there, there we have that key phrase, kara doror, which is kind of ancient Hebrew. By the time of Isaiah, the language of Leviticus was already like King James English is to us. It sounded old-fashioned and out of date. But Isaiah uses this old term, kara doror, to proclaim liberty to captives, which for the listeners would hark to that ancient passage of Leviticus 25 about the year of Jubilee. And that's associated with the coming of the God's servant, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, we notice that as well, another way of talking about the Jubilee year. So Isaiah saw that this would be fulfilled, but Isaiah does not give us a chronology about when it's going to be fulfilled. The only prophet who gives us a chronology for the fulfillment of these Jubilee hopes is the prophet Daniel. And this is in a key passage of, of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. Now, in the context of Daniel 9, what's going on is that the prophet Daniel is noticing that the, uh, the Babylonian oppression of the people of Israel is, has come to an end. 
And the prophet Jeremiah said that this Babylonian oppression would end after 70 years. And so Daniel notices that it's ended, and yet the restoration of the people of Israel that Jeremiah uh, predicted is not yet coming to be. It's not coming to fruition. And so Daniel enters into prayer, and he begins to repent. It's an intercessory prayer in Daniel 9. He steps forward like Moses of old and intercedes for the people of Israel and says, Lord, bring, this, bring these promises that you spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. <coughs> bring them to fulfillment, um, even though we have not repented. And this is key. Where are these prophecies of restoration after the 70 years of Babylonian captivity? They are in Jeremiah 25 and in Jeremiah 29. But the prophet Jeremiah put a condition, though. He put a condition on the fulfillment of that restoration after 70 years. He said, if you repent, if you seek the Lord with your whole heart. And that was what was missing. If you look in Daniel 9, Daniel, 9, uh, Daniel prays back to the Lord and says, Lord, all these punishments have fallen upon us. Our land has been taken away. Our city's been destroyed. We've been taken out of Babylon. And despite all of that, we have still not repented. And that Daniel sees as the reason why that promised fulfillment has not come about, even though the 70 years of Babylon have clearly ended. And so Daniel's praying there in Daniel 9, repenting on behalf of his people, and then God in his mercy sends to Daniel Gabriel, um, the uh, angel, and Gabriel speaks to Daniel and says, O oh, Daniel, 70 weeks of years are decreed for your people and the holy city. Okay, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy. Okay? A most holy what, you ask? Well, we'll come back to that. From the going forth of the word to restore Jerusalem to the coming of a Messiah, a prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay. Let's stop for a moment and break this down. Now, notice, first of all, Daniel says there's going to be 70 weeks of years. Now, Jeremiah had said 70 years. Gabriel now comes and says, no, and actually it's going to be extended to 70 weeks of years. Okay? 70 weeks of years, that's 7 times 70. <coughs> that is a period of 10 jubilees. The, ju the jubilee cycle in ancient Israel was 49 years long because the 50th year was the Jubilee, but just like our, in our octaves, okay, the eighth day of the Easter octave is also the first day of the next weekly cycle. So likewise in ancient Israel, the 50th year, the Jubilee year, was also the first year of the next cycle. So these Jubilee years fell at a distance of 49 years uh, from each other. And so a jubilee cycle was 49 years long. So 70 weeks of years is 10 jubilees. And there was an expectation among the ancient people of Israel that a, a, a set of 10 jubilee cycles was sacred. It was like a great jubilee, and God would bring a great act of deliverance after that time. And we see that that's exactly what the angel Gabriel is predicting. But as long as we're on this, do we remember anywhere else in Scripture, <coughs> excuse me, where we have this reference to 70 times 7? Yeah, okay. I bet for a lot of us, we never like made that connection. But when Peter comes to our Lord and says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive? Using the word afiemi, which is forgiveness in Greek. But afiesis, or forgiveness, was how Jubilee language was translated 
uh, in the ancient Greek Septuagint um, with, re with reference to Leviticus 25. So that language of forgiveness harks back to that chapter, and the Lord, of course, says not seven times, but 70 times seven. So that's a great jubilee. That's a, a period of 10 jubilee cycles. And so the angel Gabriel is telling uh, Daniel it's going to be this extended period of time to do what? Finish transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness. Those are all things that our Lord accomplished on the cross. To seal both vision and prophet, that means basically to close the canon of Scripture. That's another thing that happened in the New Covenant. And to anoint a kodesh kodeshim in Hebrew. To anoint a, a holy of holies or a most holy. Now, there's no further noun in the Hebrew. So this could mean a most holy place, which would be the temple, okay, to anoint a temple. Or this could be a most holy person, which would be the Messiah. So which is it? Temple or Messiah? Temple, Messiah. Temple, Messiah. Like great, you know, taste great, less filling. You know, going out. What is it? Well, both, okay? See all of the above, okay? Because in the fulfillment of this prophecy, we're going to discover that the most holy person, that is the Messiah, is also the most holy place. John 2.21, he spoke of the temple of his body, right? So this Christ's body as a fulfillment of the temple. He is both temple and Messiah. And then verse 25, from the going forth of the word to restore Jerusalem to the coming of a Messiah, an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, this is not how your English translations read. Probably all of your English translations read something like, from the going forth of the word to restore Jerusalem to the coming of Messiah, there shall be seven weeks, and for 62 weeks it will be rebuilt, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Your English translations follow the Hebrew Masoretic text in its punctuation. But the punctuation of the Hebrew Masoretic text was not put in until about the year 700 A.D. Okay? If you go back to the ancient versions, the Greek and the Syriac and all the other different translations of the Old Testament that were made before the Masoretic uh, punctuation, I don't want to get sidetracked off into what the Masoretic is, but this, the Masoretes were a school of scribes that flourished around Galilee, the, the Sea of Galilee, from around the years 700 A.D. to about 1000 A.D. And they're the ones that, for the first time, devised a way to write down vowels in Hebrew and to punctuate Hebrew. And so they wrote down their oral tradition at that later date. But when we go back earlier into the time of our Lord and before the time of our Lord into the centuries B.C., uh, we're talking about a Hebrew language that's being written without vowels and without punctuation. And all of the ancient versions that we have that were translated in antiquity long before the Masoretic text was established by the Jewish scribes combined the seven and the 62 weeks. And so the Messiah comes after 69 weeks. That is to say, at the end of this roughly 500-year period of time, the Messiah will come and then accomplish these things. All right, what is, what is Gabriel doing here? Well, Daniel saw that Jeremiah had predicted 70 years of punishment for the people of Israel under Babylon, during which time the land would recoup its Sabbaths. But despite that 70-year punishment, the... the uh, expected repentance of which Jeremiah speaks did not come about. And there's a principle in the law of Moses that if you're disciplined and you do not repent, you will be disciplined sevenfold. So we find this in Leviticus chapter 26. If by this discipline, which included exile, you are not turned to me, I will smite you sevenfold for your sins. So Gabriel is coming to the prophet Daniel in Daniel 9 
with a kind of bad news, good news message. The bad news is, Daniel, the restoration that you're praying for, it's not going to happen immediately. The good news is, it is going to happen, but it's going to be delayed by a factor of seven. So the 70 years of Babylon are going to become a roughly 500-year period during which the people of Judah are not going to be fully restored. They're going to, in a sense, continue in exile. <coughs> They're going to continue with a, a kind of ongoing exile, oppressed by their enemies, without a son of David on the throne. As Daniel mentions, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and giving heed to thy truth. The repentance that Jeremiah makes contingent on <coughs> the uh, restoration of the people has not taken place. So, as uh, Gabriel says, 70 weeks of years are decreed for your people in Holy City to finish all of these things and to bring to culmination God's saving plan. And so Daniel is the only one who gives us this chronology, and so roughly from the time of Daniel, we're expecting uh, the Messiah to come about 500 years later. And of course, that brings us to the time of our Lord, and this is why there was such messianic fervor during the time of Jesus. And it wasn't just surrounding our Lord, but if you read in the ancient Jewish historian Josephus, you'll discover that there are many messianic pretenders, and some of them are referred to even in, for example, the book of Acts, uh, as men rose up and claimed to be the Messiah, and many others that are, uh, of course, not mentioned. And why, why all this messianic activity around the first century, and really not before and really not later, it was because of the chronology of Daniel. Now, during that key a period of time at the end of B.C. and the beginning of A.D., we had the flourishing of a Jewish monastery on the shores of the Dead Sea that was part of the larger movement within Judaism called the Essene movement that was comparable in size to the Pharisees or the Sadducees. This Essene movement was a holiness movement. They were an eschatological movement. They expected the Messiah to come anytime soon. It was an ascetical movement. They practiced a lifestyle of self-denial. They alone uh, practiced celibacy among the different groups of Jews. And, of course, we know about them because they left us the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the remains of the thousand volumes that made up their library at the monastery that they maintained on the shores of the Dead Sea. And one of the last scrolls to be found and one of the most intriguing is a scroll that scholars call 11Q Melchizedek. And this is a prophecy that circulated among the Essenes. The ancient uh, Jewish historian Josephus tells us that the Essenes were renowned for their prophets. And so this prophetic document uh, takes these different scriptures related to the Jub Jubilee and interprets them uh, concerning the coming of a savior figure. So let's look at this. Concerning what the scripture says, in this year of Jubilee, you shall return every one of you to your property. Okay? It's a basically a basic line from the Jubilee law. And what is also written, this is the manner of the remission. Every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against his neighbor because God's remission has been proclaimed. That's Deuteronomy 15. Dr. Healy mentioned this. This was the forgiveness of debt law that we find in Deuteronomy. So this Essene author combines these release laws together and then interprets them and says, the interpretation is that it applies to the last days, okay, the latter days about which Isaiah speaks, this, air, this end times. And it concerns the captives, just as Isaiah said to proclaim the jubilee to the captives, Isaiah 61. So, Essene author brings in Isaiah here. It's brilliant because modern critical scholars acknowledge that all of these texts are, in fact, connected in, in a kind of a literary tradition. And this ancient uh, Essene author is, you know, pulling them together. 
even from the inheritance of Melchizedek, for they are the inheritance of Melchizedek, who will return to them what is rightfully theirs. He will proclaim to them the jubilee, thus releasing them from the debt of all their sins. Oh, this is fascinating. So Melchizedek's going to come back. Why on earth Melchizedek? Where did he come from? Well, that's always the question. It's like, you know, Melchizedek's like the biblical Spider-Man. Where are you coming from? You know, like we used to sing with the uh, electric company in elementary school. Where, Spider-Man, where are you coming from? You know, where's Melchizedek coming from? That's the $50 million question in biblical uh, theology. Melchizedek just shows up in Genesis 14. And you could rightly ask, why on earth does this Essene author connect ideas of Jubilee with Melchizedek? Well, if you go back to Genesis 14, what you find out is the Babylonians or the Mesopotamians, including the you know, people associated with what later became Babylon, came into the land of Israel and they took Lot and his family and many others captive, right? So this is like a foreshadowing of the Babylonian captivity. They, these Mesopotamian kings took them captive and started to run off with them. And then Abraham came and liberated them. And then after he liberated them from captivity and from bondage, he brought these liberated people back and Melchizedek blessed everybody. And so Melchizedek is associated with this liberation from being enslaved and from being held captive. And, uh, and he was also a legitimate priest and king. So uh, Abraham worked this kind of jubilee for Lot and for many others, and it was associated with the priestly ministry of Melchizedek. So this Essene author looks into the future and sees Melchizedek coming back, not to release everyone from monetary debt, but to release them from the debt of sin. And then he goes on, this word will thus come in the first week of the Jubilee period that follows nine Jubilee periods, okay? So we're working on these 10 Jubilees of Daniel 9. Then the Day of Atonement shall follow at the end of the 10th Jubilee period. This is the end of the 490 years predicted by Daniel. Look at how he's combining all these scriptures together. When he... <coughs> Excuse me. When he, speaking of Melchizedek, shall atone for all the sons of light. That's a, that's a phrase that, sons of light is a phrase that we find in John and in Paul. Uh, but even before them, we find it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the people who are predestined to Melchizedek. So this great atonement for sin is going to happen at the end of this 490 years, roughly 500 year period foreseen by Daniel. And that is going to be the time decreed for the year of Melchizedek's favor. Now, Isaiah 61.2 says the year of the Lord's favor. But notice how Melchizedek is put in here in place of the Lord. And for his hosts, together with the holy ones of God, for a kingdom of justice or a kingdom of judgment, just as is written concerning him in the songs of David, God has taken his place in the council of God in the midst of the angels, he holds judgment. Look at that. Psalm 82.9 is quoted by this ancient author as referring to Melchizedek. Okay? And um, this, the, the reference to God in Psalm 82.1 is taken as a reference to the figure of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is somehow divine in this prophetic writing from the Essenes. And he goes on, Therefore Melchizedek will thoroughly prosecute the vengeance required by God's statutes. In that day he will deliver them from the power of Belial. This is the Essene term for Satan. And from the power of all the spirits predestined to him. So it's delivery not from human slavery, but again from slavery to Belial or Satan. And then further prophecies are applied to Melchizedek. It is written concerning him who says to Zion, your God reigns, that's Isaiah 52, 7, 
Zion in this passage is the sons of righteousness who uphold the covenant and turn from walking in the way of the people. That's probably a reference to the Essene group that practiced repentance. But then your God in Isaiah 52, 7 is Melchizedek, who will deliver them from the power of Belial, Satan. Hey, look at taking references to God and saying it's Melchizedek is, is God referred to in Scripture. Concerning what Scripture says, then you shall have the trumpet sounded throughout all the land of Israel. It goes back to Leviticus 25, 9. And then our text breaks off. So this is an absolutely fascinating eschatological exegesis of the Jubilee year laws of Leviticus 25, bringing in a divine Melchizedek who's going to you know, actualize all these expectations at the end of the 500-year period predict predicted by the prophet Daniel. And now we come back to this sermon at Nazareth, okay? So imagine, brothers and sisters, 11Q Melchizedek was this prophetic document that was circulating among the Essenes. The Essenes, according to Josephus, were comparable in size to other sects of Jews like the Pharisee movement and the Sadducee movement. And Josephus tells us that there were Essene communities in every major city of Israel, all through the land. Everybody, there was, a, there was an Essene neighborhood in any city of Israel of any significant size. So everybody knew about the Essenes. They were like Baptists. They're everywhere, okay? So you knew about them, and you knew about their expectations. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. So... Uh, and, and people, you know, just like we have a general sense of what Seventh-day Adventists believes or what, what Methodists believe or what Baptists believe, so on, so different groups of Jews had a sense for what was believed by these different groups. So everybody had a sense for what the Essenes were expecting. So Jesus comes to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and he went to the synagogue as his custom was on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and there was given to him the book of the prophet Isaiah, Okay. Well, that's unexceptional because Isaiah was the favorite prophet, still is the favorite prophet. Isaiah is the prophet that dominates the Jewish and the Christian liturgy and lectionary and always has. For as long as we've had historical records, Isaiah has been the most popular prophet uh, to read in worship. So they give him the prophet Isaiah. Well, that's unexceptional. That's like a, that's like a, 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 you know, a nice, easy softball pitch here. Here you go. Here's Isaiah. You know, we're not going to give you anything difficult like Ezekiel or, you know, Zechariah or something like that. You know, just give you Isaiah. Isaiah is easy listening. You know, Isaiah is top 40. You know, there's no, can't go wrong with Isaiah. So give him Isaiah. It's nice, nice and polite. You know, find something nice to read from Isaiah. You can have a nice, easy homily. He opened the book and find the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, send me to proclaim release to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus opens up Isaiah and intentionally finds one of the most controversial passages in the whole prophetic book. Like, come on, visiting rabbi, just go with something easy like Isaiah 11 or something, you know? Or go to Isaiah 9 and talk about, you know, one day the Messiah is going to come. Why go to Isaiah 61, which is quoted as extensively in this Essene document, and there's all this brouhaha going around within Judaism. You know, is Isaiah 61 really talking about the coming Melchizedek, like the Essenes say? Or is that a bunch of nonsense, like the Sadducees say? So he finds this controversial passage that's associated with all these end times hopes from the Essenes. We know that, that Nazareth was kind of Essene sympathetic because archaeologists just two or three years ago, uh, you know, doing, doing research in the Nazareth area, found that they were practicing Essene farming practices in the first century during the time that our Lord lived there. They went down to the soil level and looked at the, the stuff in the soil found out they, that they were farming according to the way that, you know, the Essenes said you had to farm. So 
the village of Nazareth seems to have been sympathetic with the Essene movement. And Jesus finds this controversial passage. He reads it, and everybody's in shock. Like, he read that? Well, what's he going to say about it? Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Now, brothers and sisters, I never used to understand this passage at all. Because our homilists sit down when they're done preaching, right? So when Jesus sits down, I think, oh, we're not going to have a homily at daily mass today, right? Yeah. But that's wrong, because in the Jewish tradition, you preached sitting down. So when he sits down, that means I am going to give a homily. I'm not just going to read, I'm going to expound. So we are going to have a homily at today's you know, daily mass at the synagogue. So he sits down, and now the people are electrified. Not only is he going to read that, but he's going to preach on it. So all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. Yeah. They're like, what's he going to say about this controversial passage that's associated with the coming of a divine Melchizedek by one of the largest movements within Judaism? What does he say? Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's the shortest, most impactful daily mass homily you're ever going to hear. You know, there's priests around that you say are the master of the short homily, right? There's a Dominican priest up in Youngstown that I frequently hear. is like, you know, he says he's master of the three-minute homily. But, but you can't beat this. What's he saying? I'm the fulfillment, and that's the homily. Amen. Yeah, I am the fulfillment, brothers and sisters. It's me. Let's talk about me. Yeah, yeah, I'm the one here. Yeah, that's, that's me. It's, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. that's my biography right there that, that Isaiah is talking about there. Okay, wow. So what? So you, Jesus of Nazareth, whose dad we know, whose dad was a, you know, craftsman and whose mom we know and he's got cousins in the village and stuff like that you are the divine Melchizedek who's come to uh to inaugurate the eschatological jubilee well wow that is a bold claim but you know what talk is cheap let's see your game bring on your game well what does Jesus do Just a few verses later, he goes down to Capernaum. In the synagogue there, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. Cried out, ah, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You're the divine Melchizedek. Jesus rebuked him. Be silent, come out of him. And he came out of him, having done him no harm. They were amazed, said, what is this word? With authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports of him went out from every place in the surrounding region. I bet. Because not only is he claiming this, but then he's proving it. What did, what did they say? What did 11Q Melchizedek say? It said that Melchizedek would free them from the power of Belial. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's exercising people. He's doing what they expected the divine Melchizedek to do. All right, so freeing him from the, freeing people from the power of Satan, that's one of the roles of the Melchizedek to come. What else? Well, the next chapter. (coughs) This is very intentional on Luke's part. The very next chapter. Behold, men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, but finding no way to bring him in, They went up on the roof and let him down with his bed into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who can forgive sins but God? Darn right. That's the point. God is Melchizedek, is Jesus. Okay. He is the divine priest king who is to come. Freeing people from bondage to Satan and bondage to sin. So look, you know, I used to think that the Gospel of Luke 
was written, you know, just to Gentile Christians, and that's kind of a common thing. And, and there's truth to that, very, very much truth. It's many things in Luke are written in such a way that they're accessible and that they gain the trust and the admiration of people that were well-educated in the Greco-Roman system. But there's many dimensions to the Gospel of Luke. And when I was working on my book on the Dead Sea Scrolls, I found this connection that the beginning of Jesus' ministry, you know, he, our Lord fulfills what the Essenes were expecting of the anointed Melchizedek at the end of time. Is that accidental? Can that be accidental? I don't think it can be coincidental. So there's many audiences. I think the Essenes were one of the audiences to whom Luke was writing to show to them, look, Jesus of Nazareth meets the expectations that you have for the one who's going to inaugurate the end times jubilee. <coughs> so they went up on the mountain. Well, okay, so great. So Jesus does this, but like that was then, this is now. How is this going to be made permanent? How is this going to extend through time? Well, look, watch what our Lord does. Goes up on the mountain, called to him those whom he desired. They came to him. He appointed 12 to be with them, and he sent them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. So he gives this jubilee power of freedom from Satan to the 12 to be perpetuated in them and their successors. And likewise, in Matthew 18, he uh, gathers the 12 together, and he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Can't talk about all that this means, but this includes, among other things, the power to forgive sin, to forgive it or to choose not to, uh, parallel with what John records, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So the, the twofold power of the divine Melchizedek, who's going to inaugurate the eschatological jubilee, to free from slavery to Satan and from the debt of sin, is manifested in Jesus' early ministry, given to the apostles and to their successors to be perpetuated so that we're living in perpetual jubilee. And I had a beautiful experience a couple of years ago. I'll try to keep this super short. I was in San Diego. A lot of Chaldean Catholics in San Diego, these are Iraqi Christians, traditional Iraqi Christians in the Chaldean tradition, have a beautiful liturgy of their own. And I was speaking at um, John Paul the Great University down there, and they have a couple of Chaldean priests who also teach. And one of them pulled me aside and he was like, you know, explain to me the beauty of their liturgy. And, and he said, uh, you know, I just want to share with you some of the riches. You know, I know that you're an Old Testament scholar, you're into Hebrew and so on. And so he gave me a bunch of books about the Chaldean language and the Chaldean uh, lectionary and spiritual traditions. And he gave me one book on the Chaldean liturgy and he handed it to me. And I took it, and uh, I looked at the title, and chills began to go up and down my spine because of what I had worked on my dissertation on. And I looked at the title, and it was called Perpetual Jubilee. That was how they describe their liturgy. And in the Chaldean Rite, the liturgical year is divided into units of seven weeks Every liturgical season is seven weeks long, culminating on a 50th day, because they got it. They saw it, that the liturgy of the new covenant is the fulfillment of these covenantal jubilee expectations of the people of Israel. So how is this perpetuated? So how do I experience jubilee? Well, one of the, through the sacraments, ultimately, and most poignantly, through an, a neglected sacrament, the sacrament of reconciliation. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the presbyters of the church. Let him pray over him. The prayer of faith will save the sick man. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. This is an early form of the sacrament of reconciliation when the presbyters, whom we later call priests, would pray over those who had sinned. Therefore, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed." The sacrament of reconciliation is one of the most direct ways that the church perpetuates jubilee by freeing people from slavery to Satan and from the debt of sin. Father Gabriel Amorth, about whom a movie's being made right now with, I believe, Russell Crowe, 
preparing to play the role of Father Morth. This is going to be really interesting, okay? But Father Morth has wrote in his book, his 1999 book, and Exodus tells a story. Many times I've written that Satan is much more enraged when we take souls away from him through confession than when we take bodies away through exorcism. You see, uh, confession has a spiritual warfare dimension, okay? Confession is, is the first lines in the church's battle against slavery to Satan, amen? And that's going to be the theme of my breakout talk. So I'm not going to go any further with that for right now. But if you come to the breakout talk uh, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about that spiritual warfare and confession and confession as, as liberation, liberation from the evil one and all that means and the biblical roots of that and its pastoral implications. But for right now, we got to wrap up. Look, Israel's hopes for the Jubilee were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The new covenant is the era of perpetual Jubilee. And this closet that we go into to open up our souls is not a courtroom. It's not a judgment chamber. It is liberation. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen.